Okay, so today's talk is going to be about pruning techniques, the tools that are used for specific pruning, and then the care of those tools. Um, being in the business, we see a lot of bad pruning. And um, <laughs> so bad that sometimes it brings tears to our eyes because we just, we look at some of the plants and we can't save it. So we have to take it out. And um, so I'm hoping that uh, some of the techniques that I talked about today will help with your um, your pruning and uh, help you become more proficient at it. <laughs> you don't want to do this. <laughs> we see a lot of this. <laughs> Either meatballs or squares. And it doesn't matter whether it's an azalea or a forsythia or a rhododendron. Um, Sometimes I don't even know what it is until it blooms, and then I can tell that it's there's an azalea that's in that square somewhere. And um, please don't do this to your shrubs. Uh, it just the the shrubs. Each shrub has its own natural way that it grows. Some grow like a base and come up and like this, like a leucothwe. Um, some grow out horizontally, like an azalea. They all have different types of growth patterns. And when it gets cut like this, this is the sample of when we see a shrub like this, we can't fix it. Uh, we, we just we just can't fix it, whether it's round or square. Here's some other some other varieties of pruning. Great clips. <laughs> this was a crepe myrtle. Um, that can't be saved. It can't be saved. And uh, and here's an example of a square azalea and uh, it just it, it's just not the right thing to do and the poor shrub just uh, gets stressed and then once it's stressed um, insects and disease can set in and it just starts the whole process of, of deteriorating and going into death but I'm going to teach you about why we prune the types of pruning that we do how to prune and then how to take care of your tools. Why we prune? There's a variety of different purposes for pruning. And a lot of the time we come in and we call uh, what we call re re rejuvenation or renovation pruning. This is when, this is actually a um, prosythia, um, out of control. <laughs> and that's a type of plant that when it's out of control, uh, if you went into the inside and looked at it, it's like this. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just all over. And then sometimes it has the branches down to the ground and it's rooting into the ground and it just, it's just starting to go and go and go. So in order to rejuvenate prune this shrub, this is what has to get done to it. And don't be afraid to do stuff like this. It depends on what time of the year you do it and what type of shrub it is. But don't be afraid to do this because the shrubs love it. Um, this would just keep looking like this. If we did nothing to it, it would just look awful like this. Now, when it gets pruned like this, next year, this is going to be a lot thicker, but it's going to have more of a, a base shape. It grows, the forsythias grow like a, like a base. And anytime you cut, whether it's a shrub or a tree, anytime you cut it, it sends a message down to the roots Oh, I need to send them up more shoots. And that's the same with grass too. Anytime you cut grass, only one third of it, that's how you get your grass to be nice and thick. It sends on a message to those roots, send out more rhizomes and grow more, more stems. So this was really cut hard. So it sent a major message down to the roots that next year, this is gonna grow up pretty thick and pretty <coughs> tall, but it's gonna have its natural shape. We didn't just come in here and just cut the tops and come along the sides. We also went in and pruned out any crossing branches. You wanna, there's, let me back up. There's three main points as far as pruning of what you wanna do no matter what shrub it is. The first thing you do is you take out anything dead that comes out first. Second thing that gets pruned is anything that's crossing. And um, even if it's close to being crossing, because by the time next year comes, it's probably gonna be touching and crossing. Choose the stronger of the branches. 
get rid of the weaker one if you've got a, a crossing branch situation. The third part is to prune so that there is air circulation going through the middle of the plant, no matter what plant it is. So after the first two steps are done, that's when take a walk around the plant and start airing out the middle of the plant, either by cutting down at the base or by just pruning off certain branches, but to allow air to come through that shrub. That's number one, two, and three on any, any plant. When yes. You, when you cut something dead, suppose part of the branch is, is alive and the other part, the part of it is dead. Do you just cut the dead part or should you go all the way down? All the way down. Oh. If the bottom part is dead? No, if, the, if you have a branch uh -huh. uh, and, and this part of it is dead, okay. do you just cut it to there? or Just, you cut, cut, the... just cut to new wood. Okay. Just cut to new wood. And then just yeah if you're just cutting dead start with just cutting down to new wood that that branch may come off a little bit later on but just start off cutting off the dead okay. and then as you're looking at that shrub and if it happens to be a weak branch um, that one then that's when it would come off don't cut it off all the way at the bottom right off at the beginning okay. go slow when you're pruning shrubs just go slow because you can't take and stick things back on after <laughs> <laughs> so just go slow you can always take it off um i know when i prune there's sometimes i look at a branch and i go my first gut feeling is to take that off and then i said wait let's wait you know walk around a little bit more and it may take me five or six times around this shrub and then finally it'll come off but, but I, it's usually my gut instinct that tells me what needs to come off. And then as you get more proficient at pruning and you start learning the natural shapes of the shrubs, you'll know right off the bat what needs to come off and what needs to stay. Another type of pruning, training. This is a um, uh, climbing hydrangea. And this, if you don't watch it, will take over very quickly. Um, and if it didn't get pruned, all this would end up being covered and you wouldn't even see the deck. So same thing with training. Um, if I was going to come in and prune this, I'd get this all off the ground. I'd prune everything off the ground here. I'd prune up a little bit in here to get air underneath the plant. Um, I would keep this up in here just to help this grow and, and pull the shrub up this way. Uh, and again, do your dead, do your crossing branches, and, and then do your air circulation. For a, a vine like this though, um, there's two types of the air circulation, either down at the bottom, like I said, to lift this up a little bit and prune so I could see the base of the uh, plant and its separate stems, and then to prune some air circulation within the shrub itself. Um, any questions? I have one like that, that was on an old fence, but then we're putting in a new fence and I can't, I'd like to get that old fence out, but it's so huge. How low can I trim it? I know maybe, I mean, down to there, really? Oh, and then I could get that fence out. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it, it is, you're right, it just took over. Yep. And, um, interesting. So, when? When you want to do that in the spring. Before? When, when you start seeing new growth coming mm -hmm. up out of it, mm -hmm. that's when you can prune it. Because then you know, if you cut that, you're going to send a major mes message down to the roots it's going to start sprouting up again and it's going to it's going to sprout all over the place so cut it get your fence out and then oh, okay. be prepared for it to grow take off take okay. off on you yes what about pruning the thing the pieces there under the overhang definitely here yep yeah. because uh this is a more of a, a sun plant so this will just end up either staying like that or start to come up through the floor of the uh, deck so good mm -hmm. idea okay pruning for purpose uh, shaping. Now we sh I showed you some, um, I think those were boxwoods in the beginning where, the, where they were pruned, pruned as meatballs. Um, this is a boxwood. Box. Number one thing for boxwoods, I'll call you, back. you don't want to use shears on them. You don't want to use electric shears or 
hand shears like this. They need to be hand pruned. And um, I don't have a knife. Um, one of our pruners on our team, she worked down in Atlanta, Georgia for many, many years. And they have a lot of boxwoods down there. And they pruned a lot of boxwoods. And the way they prune boxwoods is by a knife. They use a knife like a, um, like a pen knife. Mm -hmm. And um, and just go and nip like you're taking. It's similar to taking uh, the greens off the top of a strawberry, and mm -hmm. and that's how. And just use your thumb, and you prune it that way. And what that does, it keeps the shrub green. If when a um, uh, shears, electric shears or hand shears are used on it, it ends up turning it brown, mm -hmm. um, and then you're there trying to prune all the brown off. So just use uh, a knife in your hands and it's and it's real quick and easy, but it's very time consuming. But, but at the end though, the shrub will look a lot better, a lot healthier. And um, boxwoods have to be pruned at least a couple of times a year. Um, so just to remember that if you have time to be able to do that. What is, what is the natural shape of a boxwood? Yeah. Sort of round. Um, this is the upright boxwood, um, Green Mountain. And the, the little boxwoods that are either you know this big or this big or this big, they're sort of round, um, but they're not meatball round. They okay. almost yeah, look right. like clouds. Yeah, That's right. what they look like. They look more like clouds. They have different... Um, it's not just one big round thing. It's like a, a round thing here and then a round part here, and just very natural, very, very not sharp, like uh, if like if you pruned it with the shear. Um, so as long as when you're pruning, when you look back, they all kind of have their own shape. They all grow um, similar, but they all have their own unique shape. So if you look back and stand at it and go, oh, okay, that looks good, and just walk around it and. Whatever looks good to your eye, that's that's the shape of a boxwood. <laughs> well, you could you could certainly hand prune it into a formal shape. There's nothing you can. wrong with that. You can. Yeah. Yep. How much is too much? A third? I mean, would you believe in the third and third? Yes. Okay. So yeah, third and third. If it Sometimes was... I push it, depending on what plant it is and what time of year it is, and I'll cut something right in half, um, or it goes back to the rejuvenation pruning and it goes right down to the bottom. Say for instance a, uh, um, a rhododendron that needs to be, um, there's no help for it. It's got it's to be cut down to the base and then it will just start growing up and I'll just go. And a lot of times I do just cut, close my eyes and just cut it and then I did that for say a, a test prayer last year it. and it came back before the oh, end yeah. of the summer. It was like, oh my god. Take a box at all? No. 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 And that's, that's, that's what's cool about pruning. Every shrub has its own way that needs to be pruned. You can't prune um, a rhododendron like a boxwood or a boxwood like a rhododendron. They're all different. Um, but that, when I watched, uh, or was it your house, when um, Dawn was, was pruning your boxwoods, I go, what are you doing? I had never seen that before. Yeah. And she goes, this is the way we prune boxwoods in Atlanta. And um, um, this is Margie. Cool. She's got a lot of boxwoods in her yard, and she's got... Um, some boxwood hedges that are going around in a circle. They were pruned with um, electric shears last year and they were massacred. Um, they did not, uh, they must have been drunk when they were doing it, um, but they, they kind of dug into the boxwood and, and you, could, you could see all the cuts. So we're waiting till this spring. Dawn's going to get her knife sharpened and we're going to come out and she's going to prune all those boxwoods by hand. And, and get them down to a place where it's it's all even all the way around and, and take care of it. I think they're so. still under the snow. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brody, what time of year do you do that? Because the blossoms are on there now. Uh, Brody's get pruned right after they uh, are done flowering. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to do a rejuvenation prune, cut it down to the ground type thing. Right. As long as there's new growth, when you start seeing the new leaf growth come out, you don't have to wait um, until it blooms. But you don't want to do a rejuvenation prune on anything in the fall because 
shrubs are, are bringing their sap down and they're getting ready for winter, so they're not going to be sending up sugars and, and all that good stuff to put out new leaf growth. So you'll pretty much kill the plant if you do a rejuvenation prune in the fall. So you want to do it in the spring. Um, anywhere from, say, the beginning of May to the end of June. The summertime's a, a tough time, too, because it's too hot. Um, but when the plant starts pushing out new growth, that's when you want to do it. For improved fruiting. I don't know um, much about apples, only knowing that they need to be pruned out horizontally. And um, if they've got a lot of branches on them, you're going to lose your fruit because the plant is going to be trying to keep those branches alive instead of putting their energy towards making fruit. Um, blueberries. Uh, blueberries are similar to uh, lilacs. I would look at my blueberry shrub, take out anything dead after winter so I could see what's dead. Um, look at anything that's crossing, get it out of there. And then, depending on how old the shrub is, if there's um, some very old stalks in there, and you'll see the difference. The old ones are kind of woody and brown. The new ones have like a, um, a light green coloring to them. I can take out one third of those stems, of the, of the big stems. So I would go through and I, I take my biggest third, one third of those stems and cut them right down to the ground. And again, I'm sending that message to the plant. <coughs> I gotta send up more shoots. So more new shoots are going to come up and that's what's gonna keep that, that shrub producing fruit. Um, because the fruit gets produced, the, the fruit slows down um, on the older stems. So every time you have more new shoots, you've got more fruit that it, that's going to produce, get produced. One thing about apples that Kyle Kyle uh, Wheeler, who works for us, has a degree in fruit horticulture, mm -hmm. and apples are dependent, and I think pears and peaches are as well. That there's a certain number of let me call them, them degree days, but mm -hmm. it has to be below freezing for X number of days. It's somewhat varietal dependent, and then <coughs> the apple tree is absolutely dormant. Then it can be pruned. You don't want to be pruning it. I mean, it's almost too late now, mm -hmm. um, and you don't want to be pruning it in November. It's uh, in the dead of winter is apple tree pruning time. And that's because if you do it at any other time, it bleeds. The sap comes out and it just bleeds too much, and then that ends up killing the tree because it's it's losing its life force. Um, but there's different ways. Um, like I mentioned, apples are pruned more on horizontal branches. Um, pears are pruned more upright like this, and peaches are more like this. And, and, and it all works for those particular plants because that's the way you get most fruit, by pruning it a certain way. That's a whole nother class. <laughs> <laughs> Overall health. In this picture, all these brown and green plants are spireas. And that I would look at and there'd be two choices either depending on what the customer wanted either to remove them or to rejuvenate prune them and um, to rejuvenate prune a spirea in this kind of shape I don't know if you can see it there's just a lot of dead there's a lot of holes and a lot of dead in here it would take hours to get in there and just cut the dead out the best way to do it is just take your shears and cut it down to about this tall. Just cut everything off, everything off. And there'll probably be some dead stems in there. If you can pull out the dead stems, that would be nice. And then it'll come back. Spirea is really good about doing that. And what time of year? What time of year? Uh, probably in the springtime. What about Cotone Aster? Which one? <laughs> just the normal sticky one not the not the willow leaf one that's kind of uh, light and airy and just kind of is it more um stocky and yeah okay yeah, they all they all make berries right they so, all make berries yeah. but it, some oh, of them yeah. have different growing patterns okay. um i don't know I would okay katoni aster same thing wait till spring and take off your dead first Take off your 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 uh, crossing branches, and then look at the overall shape of it. It kind of grows like a 
flattened out uh, base shape. Yeah. So take anything out that's down below, any of the good shoots that are coming up because that'll just block airflow and, and just take off and, and trim the branches slowly as you walk around that shrub. But it's, it's prunable. Yeah, so it's sort of, you know, that's what. Uh, yeah, it's very, it's very different that. from this because this is, this is um, very. Um, um, you call that a spirea? Spirea, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Cotoneasters like are that. more woody and yeah, thick. That's more dense. Yeah, this is a more dense, lighter wood, but very dense. Mm -hmm. um, I think I have a spirea that's very tall. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they get, right, so they get pretty big. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Spirea is also like hedge trimmers. Yeah. Yep, and after they flower, you can do it again. Yes. Yep. I do, but I was gonna say, am I supposed to do that again? But I, do. I do, I do, I do it. Um, let's see, I've got some dwarf ones over at St. David's, and then we prune them, I think, around the end of June, beginning of July, and it just keeps them thick, right? It keeps them from turning into this. Um, and sometimes you just second bloom, yeah, yeah, that's why I went to dwarf ones <laughs> because they take the. Anthony water it gets too big. It's just too big. Um, pruning for purpose. Um, talked about this already. Uh, airflow, whether it's a tree or a shrub, every tree and shrub has to have some airflow going through it. Um, roses, lilacs, um, in particular. Um, <clears throat> but in general, pretty much every shrub and every tree. So uh, anyone that has uh, maples and uh, hickories and oaks on their property, those trees, um, they do need to be cared for as far as thinning out over the years because they just get so thick. Um, the airflow can't get through it. And then what happens is during hurricane season, those winds come through and they get caught in those trees instead of blowing right through, instead of the wind blowing right through it. So keep an eye on your trees too. Um, instead of cutting down trees, another way to uh, let some light in is to just come in and thin it. And that's what um, uh, John's doing there is, is up in the tree and he's thinning the trees to allow more sunlight to come through. So you don't have to take trees down all the time. <laughs> Formal pruning. There's more boxwoods, um, and that's all done by hand. That's all done by hand, and that's that's constant pruning. Um, too much for me. You can see the heebie-jeebies just looking at it. She um, works fast. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, she is. Mm -hmm. But uh, formal pruning is 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 pruning your shrubs into, you know. Uh, nice cool shaped um you know a horse or a duck or whatever something something like that or you know something like this but it, it takes a lot of time and it takes the right shrub to do that too you can't you can't just do this with any shrub so i'm thinking that there's a lot of people in here that don't do this because it takes a lot of time um formal hedge pruning this is this is a cool um picture this is how you want to prune your hedges. This is the way I see most hedges pruned. Right. Don't want to prune it like this because what happens is even though this is maybe, I don't know, 10% angle, 20%, there's enough shade that comes down here that shades these bottom branches and then the bottom part of the shrub ends up getting thin. And it's all because it's pruned this way. You want to prune it this way similar to that picture up there. So then as the sun shines down, all the plant gets enough sunshine to keep this thick down in here. If you don't like the straight sides and the hard angles, you can round it off mm -hmm. in that shape. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be straight, but. Right, just as long as it's more narrow at the top and wider at the base. But this is for all shrubs and I, it doesn't matter whether it's a privet <clears throat> or um, whatever you have a shrub. When they get more rain too at the base. Exactly. This one cutting it off. Exactly. And then also with this one, um, with snow loads, this is this is dangerous because it can it can break these branches off of here. So any sh any uh, uh, 
hedge that you might have. And then also notice here, it doesn't go all the way down to the ground. Again, it's to, to open that up because there's, there's not much circulation going on in this, this shrub here. So you wanna get some air down in here so it can go up through the plant to keep those bugs and um, disease out. And then say if this shrub here or this hedge was in your yard and it was really thin up in here and it was a privet, there would be no way to continue pruning that and have it get in thicker. You have to rejuvenate prune it and that means cut it down to about here, just all the way across. And what that's going to do, if I cut it right here, it's going to send a message down to the roots, send up more growth, and you're gonna start getting growth coming out of these, and it's gonna be thicker. If, let's see, another, um, ink berries, if anybody has any ink berries. Ink berries tend to um, be thick at the top and thin at the bottom. When you prune an ink berry, take your hand pruners, not shears, and go inside the shrub about two feet, one foot, different heights inside the shrub. So I'm hitting different branches at this height, at this height, this height, over here, down here. So it again gives that message to send up new growth and it'll keep it thicker down here. If I only keep pruning up in here, it's going to be thicker up here and it's gonna be thinner down here. So I wanna get inside that shrub and ink berries around, so you're gonna walk around it and just kind of go maybe about a foot from the, the base and at foot increments all the way through the shrub and that'll help keep the shrub thick all the way down to the base. <laughs> and this is some more formal pruning. You should really go nuts wow. with formal pruning. <laughs> um, there's a park or garden over in Rhode Island called Green Animals um, and you can see all kinds of cool stuff like this, but it's it's a lot of work, and, uh, but it's really cool. Okay, naturalistic pruning. That's what we're going to talk about, um, and I already talked a little bit about it. That that all shrubs have their own unique shape, and that's what we pay attention to when we go. Even if I come across a plant that I've never seen before, I'll look at it and I'll. Um, kind of study its growth pattern, and that gives me a hint on how I need to prune it. Um, but there aren't too many plants I don't know. I come across some every once in a while. Persithia. Yeah. This is what it's supposed to look like. Exactly. Not this. Not this. This is what our town does to our Persithia, and I get so upset at seeing it. Forsythia is the type of plant you don't want it in your foundation. You want it out in your backyard someplace because it needs room to grow. Um, or next to your driveway. No. Put it out in the back so this is, this is what it will eventually look like. And then that picture that I showed you with the re rejuvenation pruning, that's what the Forsythia will look like the following year. It will just come up and do its thing. And... Um, that's what it's supposed to look like. Oh. Lilacs. Oh. <laughs> mm. This one had electric shears used on it. And they did it at the wrong time of the year. And I had a I had a customer probably about 10, 15 years ago. She called me in and she says, I'm not getting any lilac flowers on my shrub. And I'll go, well. And she goes, my neighbor has these beautiful lilacs in there. I go, what are you doing? I go, I'm not doing anything. I go, well, when are you pruning? Oh, I prune in October. I said, oh. <laughs> no. I said, put your pruners away. I said, you're pruning all your flowers off. So the next year, I said, don't even bring your pruners out of the garage. Just leave them in there. And I said, you won't have flowers next year. I said, but you'll have flowers the year after. And she eventually had flowers. But lilacs get pruned after they bloom, right after they bloom. And lilacs, there are some lilacs in the area that um, have been here for two, 300 years. They're very old, um, they're gorgeous, but some, they get old. 
So that's what I was talking about before, about taking out one third of the old stems. Take out the oldest, biggest stems each year, cut it down to the base, and then over three years, you'll have a whole new lilac shrub. Don't cut it off the top, cut it at the base, and new shoots will come up and you'll have a brand new shrub three years with all new shoots, green shoots that will produce flowers. Um, some lilacs, the flowers are way up here mm. and there's nothing down in this area mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason why you would look and see, take the, the one third, one third, one third, one third of the old stems coming out, cut at the base, one third coming down from the height mm -hmm. and one third coming in on the width after it flowers, right after it flowers. Um, so you can do all three of those things at one time. At one time, yep. And, and eventually those flowers will start coming down to nose level instead of being way up here. Hmm. Sunlight plays a part in oh, yeah. whether or not they bloom, right? Oh yeah, it, uh, uh, lilac is full sunlight, not in the shade. And plants need sunlight in order to uh, create flowers. So even the plants that go into the shade, if you can kind of push them more into a little bit more sun, but they're kind of still in the shade, you'll get more flowers. They need sunshine to make flowers. Okay, how to prune. Alrighty. When using your pruners, this is how you want to prune. Whether it's a viburnum, a rose, a forsythia, anything. You want the bud to be here and then your cut to be about a quarter of an inch above that and on a slight angle because what that angle does it allows the water to shear off that a wound. You're making a wound in the in the wood so the water shears off of that and doesn't sit on top of it and maybe um, um, create a place where uh, disease will come in. This one's wrong. Can you see okay? Uh, this one's wrong because it's too close to the, the branch bud. It's going to um, either kill that branch bud or that branch bud is going to be deformed. So that's not right. This one's not right because there's too much um, stem left in here. And when this branch would grow out, you'd have this little thingamajig sticking up that would eventually die. Um, but it might end up dying back further down into here. So you don't want to do that. And then this one has a flat top on it, which the water will sit on and um, allow uh, diseases to get in there. And then the same thing, there's too much of the stem left that would end up dying and uh, die back, probably back down to here. So this is how you want to make your cuts on anything that you prune. There are some plants that are opposite. They have opposite, this is going to be a branch. So the branches come out um, evenly on both sides, or they come out alternately like this. If I wanted, if I wanted to, okay, this was a rose and I wanted this branch, I wanted the branch to grow out this way, this is where I would cut it. If I wanted the branch to grow back in this way, this is where I would cut it here. So you can be very picky about which way you want your branches to go just by looking at where the buds are coming out of the stem. On opposite type plants, this is where you want to cut it. Again, if you cut it up here, this will end up dying and might end up dying down into the, uh, the branch bud area. Um, and then this is going to come out further um, this way. Uh, any questions? Is that slanted or is that an angle? Yeah, on an angle. angle. It'd be on an, an angle. angle. Like just, not just towards the either one. But towards, not, either, not towards not either towards one. the side that has no Yeah, the main thing is to keep it about a quarter of an inch above the two buds, buds. And, and just a little bit of an angle cut. This is a chart showing where um, it's safe to make a cut. Um, so this would be an at-the-ground cut. 
if I was if these three trees were growing together and I wanted to get rid of this one, this is where I cut it. Or sometimes we dig down below uh, soil level and we cut it below soil level so it's it's covered. And you don't even know it's there. Depends on the shrub because some shrubs resprout. Right. <laughs> so if it's not a resprouter, you can cut it below the ground and you would never know it was there. Um, this is an example of what we saw on the previous page right above a bud to make a cut and then along the main branch to make a cut right here but again I'll go into this a little later not right up against that that main trunk you want to be out where the uh, the collar is um, so that can heal over and and be safe from disease and insects and then this is the main branch and this is a side branch. Again, not right up against this main branch, but a good quarter inch to a half an inch above that, that trunk area there. Multi-trunk removal. Okay. We see these a lot um, in, in our woods. A lot of the maples re-sprout and some of the maples have five or six trunks on them. And sometimes um, one of those trunks, two of those trunks have to be removed. And, but this is actually showing two trees. This is, this is one tree that had a multiple trunk on it. And it's showing that this whole one just completely comes out. You just get rid of this one completely. Once this is gone, then I'd have to look at this branch here to see what does that look like? Because it was growing inside of this other tree and it might be, uh, it might be um, partially deformed. I don't know whether this was rubbing, but if you have any area that's been rubbing, sometimes a callus will grow over it, and if it's covered, it's okay, but if it's rubbed raw, it's got to come off because the disease and insects will get in there. So this one would come off. Don't if, paint it. Hmm? No, 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 hmm. no, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. Um, so this one comes off down at the ground, and then I would look at the overall shape of the one that's left and do the cutting that I have also explained. If you cut that off, it's going to be a little lopsided looking. Though, right? Exactly. So, but it's better lopsided than having a wound where insects and disease can get in. because, And it depends on how big the wound is. Some of... Uh, when I go to construction sites, sometimes the trees get mm. hammered by the machinery, and um, the thing to do with that, or if you hit your tree with a car or something like that, is to take off anything that's loose, any of the bark that's loose uh, around the wound, and get back to a place where the bark is still attached to the tree. And then as time goes on, that tree will heal that over it's going to depending on the size of the wound um, it will heal and like Bill said no painting of wounds on trees that was something back from the 30s and 40s and 50s and it's not it's not a good thing to do because the tree has a natural uh, once it gets once it gets cut it sends a message to the cells in the tree to heal over and they have a, a natural way of healing and when that paint is painted on there, it's almost like a tar, it uh, keeps it from breathing and it ends up rotting. Um, so don't put any of that wound paint on any trees or shrubs once you prune them. Something that we didn't put in here that I need to talk about is topping. Um, never top a tree. It's a guaranteed death sentence for the tree. Um, and I see a lot of topping going on in this town and not just this town but all over and what that means is somebody comes in uh, and we get it a lot of uh, times down by the shore areas where people want to have a view and um, so they come in and they they top the tree and say this is a uh, 50 foot tree they'll take and they'll cut the tree by half and what that does is Again, it sends a message down to the roots to send up new growth. When the new growth comes up, it comes up like suckers. It's not a true branch that comes back. So when that tree, when you look at the tree, it's, it's not a nice, nicely formed branch like we have here. 
it's it's like a little ball with all these little suckers coming out. The trees the trees gone. You can't save it. You can't save it. In um, Connecticut, tree companies to do pruning have to have a licensed arborist, yeah. and li it's illegal for a licensed arborist to top trees. So the dead giveaway when you see a company topping trees is they're not licensed. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. And there's some good examples of topped trees over in front of. What's the name of that car dealer in Groton? Um, Route 12. Yeah. Cardinal. Huh? Right, right next to Cardinal. Yep, to the left of Cardinal. Kia. Um, Kia. Kia. Yeah, and it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's it's just, please don't do it. <coughs> A tree can be brought down, just like we were talking about the lilac, can be brought down one third at a time to bring it down, but one third at a time and to a safe place near a branch. And it would still, it would take three years for that to happen, but you'd still have a natural looking tree, but it would, it would be shorter instead of topping. Okay, large branch removal on a tree. If I took a saw, and just came right in here and made that cut, the weight of this branch would pull and it would rip the bark right down the tree. So you cut it in stages. Cut number one is on the bottom part of the branch because what that does, when I make this cut, it keeps it from pulling the bark off and splitting down this way. So with the first cut, is an undercut on the bottom part of the, the main branch you're trying to cut off. Second cut is right in front of it. What you do too is you take off all the branches on the, the front part of it to keep it as light as possible. And then the third cut is right in here. Not, not here and not out here. I've seen both, um, but right in here because right in this area here, you kind of see a little bit of a wrinkle here and a wrinkle in here. There are special cells in there where um, once this gets cut, sends a message to those cells, got to heal over. And um, there are special callus cells that are in all the uh, crooks of the branches in case a branch gets lost in a, in a storm <coughs> or if it gets cut. Thinning. This could be... This could be a shrub lilac, this could be a, um, um, a blueberry, it could be a rose. Um, and again, this is similar to what I was talking to you about before. I'd come in here and I'd look for the dead first and take that out. Then look for any of the crossing branches, remove those, and then start thinning it so it looks like this so that air can go through it. So you can kind of see which branches came out here, but that's what you want it to look like. I don't care what kind of shrub it is. That's the kind of air circulation. That's the kind of spacing you want to have in your shrubs for the air to flow through. You still haven't cut out of any of the main bottom branches. Um, I count seven. seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Would you? It depends. It depends, because um, some of these branches, it's not just one branch like this. They come up and they're, they're all over the place. So, so it just depends. Um, most of the time, most of the cuts are being made down in this area here to start thinning here. And then once I take, say, this branch out here, I look and see. And I take another one over here and I look and see. And so it depends. Um, because the shrubs all grow differently and they're all different thicknesses. Suckers and old stem removal. Uh, this would be for something like a Rosa rugosa, um, and it depends. Uh, Rosa rugosa is uh, sort of, if they're not pruned right, end up being all nice and thick up here and very thin down here. So there's different kinds of pruning with that too. You can either just cut it right across the top and it will send up new shoots. Or if it's already up and you want to um, thin it, same thing. Go through looking at the dead, anything that's crossing. But you can see the difference in the thickness here and here. Um, because no matter if it's a suckering shrub, no matter where you cut it, it's going to 
it's going to send up another sucker. So the suckers are going to come back. But so with it, when I um, prune a suckering shrub, I prune a little bit more than usual because I know the suckers are going to come back. Do the suckers have to turn into good stems? Oh yeah, yeah. You want it. You want to pick out. You want to pick out your your strongest ones. To get rid of the get, to keep those and get rid of the weaker ones. Yes, deadheading. Um, deadheading <coughs> could be done either pinching with your fingers or um, with a uh, pruner. And this would be something similar to like a uh, a rhododendron here, where this would get cut right at the tip, where you pinch right at the tip. Um, and that deadheading does two things. It helps to uh, take off the spent blooms so the plant is not expending energy to make seeds um, and it'll expend its energy to make more flowers. Or um, the deadheading also helps to send messages back into the, the stem to make more shoots to come out. Pruning tools and care. Okay. I tend to use um, in my pruners is what's called a bypass pruner. Um, it's a very sharp blade and a very sharp blade. And the blades, they come across each other like this. Instead of an anvil pruner comes down like this, bypass goes like this. But this is a very sharp blade in here. I use the Felco tools because they're very comfortable. They make a lot of different uh, types of handles for small hands, large hands, left hands, right hands. Um, this one happens to have a twirly because I do so much pruning, it keeps my wrist from getting tired. Um, with, that, with that twisting action, it just it takes all the pressure off my wrist and it's just really helpful. Um, so if you do a lot of pruning, it's a, it's a very, very nice pruner. This is number, uh, I think it's Felco number seven, number seven. This is an example. This is a Florian pruner. This is a ratchet pruner. The Florian tools are so cool. Um, this is an anvil pruner, which means that it's got a sharp blade and that blade comes up against this pink. It doesn't, it doesn't bypass like this. It hits it like this. Um, you want to... Sure. Show them how to use that. Sure. So it's a, it's it's ratcheting. So it takes a lot of stress off of your hands when you're trying to get through something, you know, woodier. So say, um, like a cup. So it'll it'll get to a point where it'll lock in for you, and it'll hold, and it'll pinch it for you, and then it'll get to the next point and ratchet and hold that for you and then that'll finish for you so it it holds it as it goes down then you can reset your hand and continue putting pressure yeah it's not all one shot it's it's a couple of shots right so you're not you're not applying all of your strength to try and chop through this it's, it's going to hold that for you so you can reset and restrength <laughs> So we have, this is the, the breast cancer one, these are mine, but we have the yellow ones here for sale. We also use folding saws, and they're nice because the blade folds right into the handle, so it keeps it protected. And um, the folding saws come in a, a lot of different teeth sizes. Uh, they, they have smaller teeth for a finer cut, they have... Um, Uh, larger teeth for really cutting anything you want. Um, but what's nice is that it, it just locks up, fits right into that groove, and it's protected. But these are great because um, um, instead of carrying a big saw, you just stick this in your pocket or whatever, pull it out, and just go and start going. And we've got these for sale too. Next one, these are the cool ones. Um, <clears throat> these are for larger branches, same thing. It's a ratcheting lopper where it catches and it's not this trying to prune it. It's, it's just 
one little thing like this, and it just it cuts through it like butter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you got the big oh, ones. That's the big one. okay. <laughs> You want to do it? No, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but they trust me. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. So you'd want, the, you'd want the blade on the bottom on something that side. You could do, I, I had it on the bottom. You could do it bottom or top. I don't know if it, if it Usually matters. I keep the green in my right hand, <clears throat> or depending on what, if you're a lefty, you want it, you want the green in whatever hand is your most uh, prominent hand. So I would have okay. had, I would have had this section on the bottom. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But these are, because we do so much pruning, um, I just, and I've tried a lot of tools in the last 19 years, and these are the tools that we come down to as far as using all the time. What do you use to keep them sharp? <laughs> one one thing of the Florian tools is that you can actually send them. Florian's a Connecticut company. You can actually send them back, and they'll re re rebuild them. <coughs> Invoice you for the so. They'll give you a new one. They'll, so. they'll see how bad how off it is, and, and yeah. they'll offer you another pair. And yeah, so pretty cool. I've tried all kinds of different ways to keep my tool sharpen and I have found that a diamond um, sharpener works best. Uh, the proper way to sharpen any one of these is to always go in one direction. So if this was... Do we open that? Yeah. Again, it depends on the tool. Um, any of the larger tools, I could actually use a file, but a fine file. But to always just go in one direction. And this is a this is a diamond. You don't want to be going back and forth like this. It's one one direction. Can you press down? I can't see. Yep, I'm pressing down, and it's there's kind of like an angle on the, the edge of the blade and I'm just following that angle and going in one direction. I don't have to worry about this part here. Sometimes I do the other side, but mainly it's just one side is good enough to um, keep it keep it filed. And it's very important for any of your tools that you use to keep them sharp. Mm -hmm. But um, just, just carry this on you and it's the easiest thing I've found so far. And I've tried all kinds of cool I thought they were cool, and it's been a pain in the butt. What about a stone? A stone too. A stone you can take, but that's got to that's kind of got to sit down on the ground, or you've got to kind of hold it in your hand. But again, it's the oops, it's the same thing where it's it's one direction, and um, the stone has to be wet, or it has to have a little oil on it, and it has to go in one direction. Um, they come in three different grits too, depending upon how dull the. Uh, tool as they're coarse, sure. fine, and ultra fine. Oh. So they're, we have a set of three of them, or just singly <coughs> defined, which is the middle middle grade. Now, that's for that's for um, sharpening tools like this. When it comes to sharpening a saw, um, <coughs> gotta send this out. Um, this is this. They've got machines that it's just easier to. They put it on a machine and they can get every one of those. This would just drive you crazy. Um, but these tend to stay sharp for a long, long time as long as you're not cutting into uh, soil or rocks or anything like that. So um, they they don't have to be sharpened that that often. This these are my pruners left over from last year. I haven't done anything with them yet. What I'm going to do to clean them is to take some steel wool. A lot of this stuff is sap from the trees, so I just take the steel wool and I just clean it with the steel wool, get most of the, the sap off of it as best I can. Sometimes I have to take something like a, um, uh, like a pine saw and, and add that to the, uh, it actually comes pretty clean. So I do that first. And then, or if I, if it's really bad, and sometimes it's really bad, I use a, a wire brush and just get all the gunk off of it. 
I um, chosen water group. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. And um, linseed oil. I can actually take some of the linseed oil and put it on this and also clean it with the linseed oil. And then I have my little handy dandy WD 40 that I keep with me to just keep all the gears um, moistened during the season. And that's it. That's all I have to do. And then I'll sharpen them and then I'm ready. I'm ready for the season. But it's very important to keep your tools clean and sharp so they do the work that you want them to do for you. And like I was saying before, if um, you've got diseased plants in your yard, do not go from a diseased plant to a healthy plant with your pruners. Stop and um, we usually use a 10% a um, uh, mixture of water and bleach in a spray bottle and spray off the tools and disinfect them or you can use alcohol wipes anything that's handy that will disinfect them but you've got to disinfect it um, or you're going to be spreading that disease throughout all your, your plants in your yard